Save folk come to church on Wednesday. You ought to make some noise tonight. Listen, they're watching in Charlottesville, Virginia, Channel View, Texas, Wichita, Kansas, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, Melbourne, Florida, Paducah, Kentucky, Paducah, my goodness, Portland, Oregon, Mobile, Alabama, Dallas, North Carolina, Dallas, Texas, Atwater, California, Bremerton, Washington, Gidear, Arizona, Atta, Oklahoma, and Charlotte, North Carolina, and tons in Denver and Aurora. Would you watch our global internet campus audience that's watching? Do me a favor, encourage the person next to you, look at him and say, tonight, there's a word for you. Listen, we thank God so much for you all tonight. Wonderful worship and students, our junior and senior high are headed to the student center on tonight. Uh, listen, if it's your first time here, we're excited that you're with us. We call you our VIPs because you're very important to God and very important to us. At Harvest we just to change lives by leading people to totally love God, love people, and love life as one church in global location. So we're glad you're here tonight. Throughout the experience, you can text or uh, what is this? Tweet me at, at Bishop Foreman or at Harvest underscore CC. I want to jump right into the word tonight. Look at your neighbor and say, This is going to be good for us. I started to have you say something, but you only said one word at tonight. So look at him. Say, neighbor. neighbor. I hope you like talking to me because you're going to talk to me a lot tonight. I guess if you don't really like who you sit next to, this is a great opportunity to run in the restroom and come back. <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, we're going to get into the word tonight, and, uh, and it's going to be good for us. In the weekend, we, of course, are in relationship revolution. Are you enjoying that? Amen. Uh, but the Lord directed me to take us back into something again tonight, and I want to get right into it. And you, and, and you know we're going to go to a lot of scriptures because I brought out old school tonight. So when I bring out old when I bring out old school, when I bring her out, that means we're going we're gonna to hit a lot of scriptures tonight. Amen. Lift your Bibles out. Let's make our confession of faith together. This is my Bible. It is the living word of God. It gives me abundant life. I am not just a hearer of the word. I'm a doer of the word. This word teaches me that I am more than a conqueror. Somebody shout. <laughs> Amen. So on Sunday, the 915 one. And so <laughs> go to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. I want to jump right into this tonight so I can cover as much territory as I can. Proverbs chapter 6. I, I want to start by telling you um, that there's a reason you haven't seen what you've been praying for manifest. Uh, did, did, did somebody say there's a reason? And I'm going to tell you, it's probably not what you think the reason is. Uh -huh. I know you think it's the devil, but I'm going to tell you, that ain't the reason. I know you think it's your generational curses. That ain't the reason. I'm going to tell you something. Proverbs 6, and I want you to get to verse uh, number 2. You ready? You are snared by the words of your mouth. In other words, you're caught up. You, you, get, you get caught up in stuff. By the words of your mouth, you are taken by the words of your mouth. Uh, go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Could it be that you've been getting exactly what it is that you've been saying? Bishop, I speak good stuff. You spoke good stuff once. John chapter 6. Now, let me show you what happens. Every time you speak, so as I'm speaking to you right now, uh, something's happening. Say this, it's more than words. It's more than words. All right. John chapter 6, get to verse number 63. You ready? <clears throat> Look what it says. It is the spirit who gives life, the flesh, or your old nature, Adam's nature. Now you used to act. It profits you or benefits you nothing. Look at this last part. This is Jesus talking. You know, I know that is in red. He says, the words that I speak are what? Spirit, and they are what? Life. But now look at verse 64. But there are some of you who do not believe. In other words, he says, some of y'all really think what you say really doesn't have as much power and as much weight as it does. But, but tonight, somebody say tonight, tonight. Uh, I got to shift your mouth because you've been getting what you've been saying. And so for these last few months of this year, I don't know about you, but I think there's some folk in here that you came on Wednesday night because you want to see some manifestation. I don't hear nobody. I think it's a few folk that say, I want to see some manifestation in my life. I'm tired of just praying for it. I want to see something. Just your neighbor say, I want to see something. 
Father, I decrease that you might increase. Speak to us tonight that we might move and walk with in what you have ordained for us. Customize. Tailor make this message for us tonight as we move in it. Tailor make it for us as we move in what you have ordained. In Jesus' name, somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. As you take your seats, high five two or three people and tell them the law of confession. The law, the law of confession. So now we're going to go through a lot of scriptures and I want to walk through this uh, real good. So uh, Proverbs 6, 2 says as we're snared or caught up by the words of our mouth, which means you are where you are because of whatever it is you have been speaking. Watch this. You also are where you are because of whatever it is you have let speak to you about you that you didn't challenge. All right. So go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. We're going we're gonna to hit a lot of scriptures. It's Wednesday night, so we're going to hit a lot of scriptures tonight. Revelation chapter 1, and I want you to get to verse number 6. Now, this is a very uh, familiar verse. If you've been here for any amount of time, I've taught from this a, a, billion, a billion times, and this is a billion and one. Revelation chapter 1, verse number 6. It says, and he has made us. Say, he made me. Now, he's made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, watch this. God has made you to be both a king and a priest, which means in you there are two natures dwelling simultaneously. It is not the good and the bad. It is the king and the priest. Kings, uh, uh, let me just make it real, clue, uh, real, real easy for you. Kings run stuff in the natural and priests run stuff in the spiritual. Which means God created you to be an individual that has both natural dominion as well as spiritual dominion. Which means you were not created to be chump change. You were not created to be trash. You were not created to be average. Matter of fact, that's God's issue with you. God's issue with you is that you keep settling for average and thinking it's okay. He's saying, did you not know that I have made you to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, to always be overcoming and not be overcome? So say, he made me a king and a priest. Now, now watch this. I want, I, want, I want you to get this image of what kings do. Kings don't sit on the throne all day. Uh, in America, we don't have this, uh, this picture uh, quite clearly because we live in uh, what is really a uh, republic, but a democracy, it is called. Now, uh, in a monarchy, if I say monarchy, it is a system of kings and or queens and priests. Now, watch this. The king uh, only takes his throne when he's getting ready to issue decrees, when he's getting ready to say something. Other than that, it would be a waste of the position of the throne for the king to just uh, sit on it all day. You would diminish its power. You got that? Now, here's what I need you to understand. If God has made you a king and a priest, that means just like a natural king would decree something from their throne, uh, you and I have the ability to decree something from the throne that we inhabit. That's why the scripture says, and he inhabits or he's enthroned on the praises of his people. That's why when the music is going, just don't sit and look at them. That's your opportunity to go in for yourself. I don't care if you don't know the song. Just lift your hands and say, I'll sing my own song. I'll make my own song. Do you know why? Because if God is enthroned in my praise, in my worship, that also tells me since I'm seated with him in heavenly places, when he takes his throne, that means it's my opportunity to take the throne with him, which means it's my opportunity to decree something. Now watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Say, I am a king and a priest. All right. All right. So, so let me help you, Denver, because because y'all got this real bad. And I say y'all because I ain't technically from here. Technically. Now, now watch this. Uh, watch this. Say, average is not my lot. Say, getting by is not my life. Struggling is not my life. Lack is not my life. Dysfunction is not my life. All right, so I want to ask you a pregunta. That's Spanish for question. Why is it happening in your life? All right, let, 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 let's, let's walk this out. Go to Ephesians chapter 5, Wednesday night. Ephesians chapter 5. Y'all all right? All right, good. I'm going to let you shout. I'm going to turn you up in just a minute. Ephesians chapter 5. And when you get to verse number 1. So you are a king and a priest. Kings decree things. Got it? Okay, all right. So whatever the king decrees over his domain, it becomes what he says. You know why the scripture says God is not a man, uh, God, God, God is not like a man, he can't lie? You know why? Because if God was to say something that isn't, it becomes. So even if what he said, it wasn't, it will become what he said because he said it. That's why the scripture says, and he calls things that be not as though they were. See, the reason why God can't lie is because, watch this, if you had on a blue dress and God said the dress is red, the dress would have to change to match up with what he said. 
You're not hearing what I'm saying. Too many of us are agreeing with what we're seeing rather than speaking what it is that we desire to see. And you sitting up here acting like a CNN news reporter where you need to be saying, I see that it looks like a mess, but I call it in order. I see that it looks like I don't have enough to make it to the end of the month, but I say I have overflow. I know it. So, 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 so watch this. So, so look at Ephesians 5, uh, Ephesians 5 and 1. Now, therefore, be what? imitators of God as dear children. Uh, uh, say, I'm going to imitate God. All right, so then what did God do? Well, we already looked. Uh, uh, but let's just go to Genesis for those of you that maybe haven't seen it. Go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. So you're a king and a priest, okay? Kings decree things. So what the king decrees, it becomes even if it currently isn't what the king decreed it to be. Now, the issue that we often have with faith is, is that what we want to do is call it what it is versus telling it what it is. Now, here's what you need to understand. It requires no faith to report. It requires faith to decree. Because a decree, or let me give you another word, a confession often looks totally different than your current circumstance. It makes no sense for you to say, I'm healed, when the doctor just told you that technically you're not. But because you're a king, you don't bow to what they said. A king says, well, since I'm a king and a priest, everything I say around him has got to line up with what I decree. It doesn't make sense, but it makes faith. All right? All right, so, all right, uh, 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 where to go? Genesis? All right, now, um, uh, since, since we're a little bit more pedagogical in nature, y'all ain't quite there, so I'm not going to give you the revelation between Genesis 1 and 1 and Genesis 1 and 2 some other day. But get to Genesis 1 and 3. Then God did what? Come on, and God what? Then God got stressed out, called a bank. Then God had a Prozac. Now, if your doctor told you you need one, you do exactly what your doctor told you. <laughs> Bless his holy name. <laughs> uh, uh. Then God did what? Said. Then God worked really hard. That's not to say you shouldn't work hard. But what did Ephesians just tell us? Do what? Be imitators of who? God. Well, who, who's doing the talking here? God. Let's go back to Genesis. Here it is. Then God said, Genesis 1 and 3. Here it is. Genesis 1 and 3. Here it is. Genesis 1 and 3, here it is. See, I said it and it became. <laughs> then God said, let there be what? Light. Then God prayed. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. He said it, then he saw it. Look at verse 4. You read it. 1, 2, ready, read. So he, he says it, then he sees it, then he makes sure that what he sees is good. And then once he sees that he's good, then he moves on to the next thing, Genesis 1 and 5. He calls the light day, the darkness he called night, so the evening and the morning were the first day. Verse 6, then God, come on, harvest, then God what? Let there be what? Keep going. Okay, good. Stop. Uh, go to verse 9. Read it. Stop. Verse 11. Stop. Verse 14. Verse 20. Come on, y'all don't take that long to get down four verses now. Go to verse 24. Verse 26. Verse 29, 31, then he saw, okay, okay, so we're having a little difficulty here, that's okay, all right, he said it, he saw it, 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 he said it, he saw it. 
He didn't stress and didn't see it. He didn't worry and didn't see it. He didn't cuss somebody out and didn't see it. He said it, then he saw it. And watch this. And the scripture says he checked to make sure that it was good. And when it saw that it was good, he moved on to something else. How long are you going to keep the same problem that you've had? All right. All right. All right. All right. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Uh, 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 so we're imitators of God. So we're kings and priests, right? We got that. Okay. So now we understand that uh, as kings, we decree it and we confess it and it becomes what we confess and what we decree. We got that, right? All right. Uh huh? All right. So now watch this. So then, then the scripture tells us to be imitators of God. So we just read that God, uh, from Genesis 1, 3 on, God said, then he saw. So when God wanted to set up the earth, God didn't come down here and use his hands. He used his mouth. He didn't use his labor. He used his mouth. Did you get this? All right, say I'm an imitator of God. All right, so check this out. Watch this. Uh, in Genesis, God did not, I want you to pay attention to what he didn't do. He didn't confess the fact that it was dark. He didn't say, it sure is dark, but I sure would like some light. No, you know what he said? I want some light. So you know what he did? He said, let there be light. Can I tell you your neighbor's problem? You're spiritual, but your neighbor, they think that it's only prayer if they confess the problem first. But I'm here to tell you, because you confess the problem, you're giving the problem a right to remain. I'm so tired. That's why you're tired. My money is funny. That's why you broke. My kids are crazy. That's why they crazy. Y'all still here? Matter of fact, there were very few times where Jesus even laid hands on people. When Jesus was healing people, most of the time he just spoke. He just declared what he desired to see. Now, now I need you to get this because this is more than just positive confession. This is more than just saying nice things. I, I, I need us to get this. Th this is a kingdom principle. Say kingdom principle. All right, so now flip over to 2 Corinthians. So you're a king and a priest. You can decree things. Got it? Got it? And we're imitators of God. And God, when God wants something done, he talks. See, real power don't have to do it. It just says it. Real power's bark is enough to get you going. They don't have to bite. They bark gets you right. That's real power. Got it? <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 10 and get to verse number four. All right. You got it? Actually, start up in verse number three. Let's read it. Ready? Read. For though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. Now, here's what the thing. Though we're in bodies, we don't respond like natural humans. So when a natural human gets a bill, they get stressed out. They cuss. Don't, don't, see, don't y'all sit up here and look at me. The ones that won't say nothing are the vicious cussers. Like they cuss all the way up to Jewel. So don't be sitting up here, oh, I don't know anything about that. You are lying. It's Wednesday night, so I'm going to talk to you, okay? All right, so, okay, good. I'm not judging you for your cussing. I'm just saying you wonder why you ain't got nothing working because you didn't damned everything up. Nothing's flowing. You've damned it up. Look, look. You hear? All right, so the natural man, when something goes wrong, he gets stressed out, he gets worried, he gets depressed, he gets discouraged. That's what the flesh does. So look at this verse Paul is telling here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, for even though we're in bodies, he says, let's stop acting like humans. Touch your neighbor and say, quit acting like a human. See, 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 humans think that because we're at the top of the food chain, if it's beyond our intellect, it can't be done. Humans think, if I can't figure this out in my mind, there's no way this is going to happen. But, but the Apostle Paul was saying, stop thinking like a human, because if you really say that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world, then stop putting your human limitations on your infinite God. You serve the God that can speak to nothing and create everything. You serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so he says, quit acting like a human. 
Touch your neighbor and say, quit acting like a human. Look, verse 4, for the weapons, the way we fight, and I know there's some fighters in here. <laughs> I know there's some fighters in here. <laughs> I'm going to just move on. Okay. Uh, let me tell you, it's one thing I'm not concerned about. If you mess with the people of the Harvest Christian Center, you better ask somebody. You don't know now. You, you be the, I feel for you. <laughs> For the weapons of our warfare, watch this, are not carnal. They're not human, but they are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. A stronghold is something that has a, a power over all three parts of humanity. Your flesh, which is your body, and your spirit, which is you, and then uh, your soul, which is your mind, thoughts, will, and emotions. So he says these weapons will get you loose from what's got you bound. Verse 5, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought in captivity to the obedience of Christ. And look at this, and ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Look at this. Do you look at things according to the outward appearance? Now, now look at me, Horace. He's saying, uh, do you look at your life just based on what the circumstances say? He says, if anyone is convinced in himself that he is in Christ, let him again consider this is in, in himself, that just as he is Christ, even so we are Christ. Well, what are we again considering? We are again considering the circumstance that we've deemed impossible. Amen. He's saying, if you say you're Jesus and you belong to him, you belong to Christ, the anointed one, his anointing and his anointed. If you say that's you, he's saying, then reconsider what it is you've been looking at because perhaps you've been looking at it as a human, not a king. Let me say it another way. Perhaps you've been looking at it as a peasant in the kingdom rather than a king in the kingdom. And peasants look at stuff different than bosses. I don't know where I'm at, but maybe I didn't come to the right church, but I think there are a few bosses in the house tonight where you're sick and tired of life happening to you, but you're about ready to happen to life. How five of your neighbors say, I'm a boss, I'm a boss. All right, so you ought to be sick and tired of just letting life treat you any kind of way and letting life just do whatever it's going to do to you. You ought to wake up one morning and say, I'm mad as hell because I'm not putting up with this foolishness no more. I'm not struggling with this no more. I'm not going through this another day in my life. Hell is the Greek word Gehenna, which means hot trash. And watch this. He says these weapons, say weapons, he said they're not human weapons. They don't make sense to humans, but they make perfect sense to kings. Let me, let me, let me, let me because sometimes maybe the, maybe, the, uh, maybe the dichotomy between a human and a king isn't very clear. So let me change the nomenclature so that we can understand the platform from which I'm speaking to us. Because perhaps the postulation from which I'm taking is not giving you the exegetical interpretation that you need so that you have the appropriate understanding of the text. So let me just exegete for a moment. Is that okay? So basically what I'm trying to tell you is there's a difference between regular person and a king. Do you understand that? Now he just told us that he's made us. You understand what that means? He's not really asking for your input. He doesn't really care that you're tired of going to the next level. That, he, ain't really, he don't really care that you're tired of stretching. Keep on stretching until you make it to the next level. He, that, no, he says, I'm making you a king, so you're going to give me what I asked for. Lord, yeah. it's just so rough. I made you a king and a priest. So until I look at you and see king, let's stretch. And once you, think, once you get there, let's continue to stretch. Now, now watch this. Say weapons. So these weapons aren't average weapons. Got it? Our average way of dealing with things. Because we all have our average way, right? Some folk, you eat your way through your problems. It's got real quiet right there. Okay. Some folks, you porn your way through your problem. See? Ooh, wee. Got real quiet right there. Let's check them internet histories. It's got a real card right there. Okay, some folks, some folks, you gossip through your problems. 
Some folks sex their way through their problem. Some folks just depress their way through their problem. They shut the blinds, put the heat on, or put the air on, turn the lights off, turn on Netflix, and just spend time with their problems. It's real quiet in here. Some of y'all look at me strange and otherwise. It's just. What's, what's the default way? You do it, but those are some examples. I'm just using examples. I'm not beating up on nobody. I'm just using examples. We all, we all have a coping mechanism that, watch this, is our default mechanism, which hu is human and it's average. It's human and it's average. All right, so give me some other ones. Somebody give me some. Well, just give me examples. Huh? Sh shouting? Shopping. Yes. Yes. Some of y'all got shoes you ain't never wore. And truth be told, you ain't never going to wear. Oh, ladies, don't y'all look at me with that tone of voice. All right, what else? What else? Shopping. Cynicism, being a sin. All right, what else? Drinking. Workaholic. Well, now, let, let, now, let me deal with that. Because there's the difference between having a strong worth ethic and being a workaholic. And what many people lack is a good worth ethic. A good worth ethic says the job is done when it's done. Now, that's different than being a workaholic, which is the job is done, let me go create another job to do. Do you see the difference? Because some people will criticize, oh, you stay 15 minutes late, you're a workaholic. No, you're lazy. Don't, don't be saying nothing to me because I like to get my work done. Just because you're trying to hurry up and clock out and you wonder why you can't get blessed. You can't get blessed because God says, if you're not faithful with another man's, I'm never giving you your own. So I just want to clear that up. Okay, what else? Isolation. Because some people, you know some people going through their phone number change four and five times. A woman come on the phone answering their calls. The number you have dialed is. Okay, what else? Anger. That's a good one. What else? Sarcasm. Attitudes. Ooh, she ratchet. What else? What else? Some of y'all know what that means. I'll give you. Pride. Cry, 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 cry. Okay, cry, cry. So we all have these default methods, right? Okay, but the scripture told us uh, to be imitators of who? So when God had a problem, there was darkness in the earth. Did God cry? Did he get angry? Did he drink a little bit? Could you imagine Jesus? <laughs> and don't, and okay, so let's go and deal with this too. Because like, well, Jesus turned water into wine. I'm just saying, Bishop. I'm just saying. No, that's a misappropriation of the text. That's a misappropriation of the text. Okay? All right. Um, he, he, he didn't do that. You know what he did? When he saw a problem, he confessed. He spoke. He decreed. He declared. Did you get that? Okay. So if we're imitators of him, then what we have to do is switch our default response mechanism to when a problem shows up, just say, I see that that's the facts. But the facts and the truth are two totally different things. Truth in the Greek, one of the words for faith is pistis, which means truth, which means the fact may be the doctor says there's nothing we can do. But that's not the truth. Because the truth is with his stripes, we were healed. The fact may be your money is funny and your change is strange, but that's not the truth. The truth is, is that since you're a giver, your God shall supply all your need according to his riches. See, there's a difference between facts and truth. So what a king does is say, you brought me a problem. Let me decree a solution. I'm going to help somebody here. Can we turn it to second gear? A king says, you brought me an issue, but I'm going to decree a solution. You brought me a problem, but I'm going to decree a solution. Because it takes no faith to agree with what's obvious. So watch. So watch. Say, my confession is my weapon. Uh, there is a word in the Greek, uh, homo legeo, homo legeo, homo same legeo, confession. Uh, uh, confession, homo legeo, it means confession. Say confession. It literally means to do this, homo meaning the same. It means to agree with God. So when we say the law of confession, we're not just talking about you speaking nice stuff. 
we're talking about you agreeing with God. Homo legale. I agree with what he said. So I know that's what you said, but it's not what he said. And since that's not what he said, what you said really is not that valid. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Uh, uh, all right, all right. Say confession. Now, now I want to be clear. This is not naming and claiming. We're going to get you two examples, and then, and then we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna let this be, and we'll let it marinate on you for a little bit. This, this is not naming and claiming. Are we clear on that? Because some folk, you, you named and claimed stuff that ain't yours. Well, Bishop, what do you mean? The Bible says call things to be not as though they were. But if they have an existing owner. Okay, let me just give you an example. You can't be claiming somebody else that's already married is yours. Because see, what that is. See, that's already, somebody else already paid the price. Now, they might be putting it up for sale, but currently. I'm being funny, but, but so it's not just naming and claiming, right? And, and, and to be quite frank with you, there's, there's not that there's something wrong with that on the surface level, but what that has become in terms of a theological construct for most people, that just, that, that just takes it too far. What we're talking about is homo legale. We are agreeing with what he said, and the Bible calls that confession. So my confession or my decree is homo legale, which means I agree with what he said. You get that part? All right, so, so let, me, let, me, let, me, let me show you something. Uh, go to Mark chapter 11. Y'all all right? All right, we're going to go to second gear in just a minute. I thought we were there, but we're going to just slow it down. Mark chapter 11. And uh, get to verse number 12. <clears throat> Got it? Mark 11, verse number 12 says, Now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. I appreciate Jesus. He was trying to act so deep, he didn't realize he needed to eat. Because with the people he had around him, I'm certain he needed to eat so that he wasn't stressed out all the time. Because they just wasn't listening to him. So I'm just sure he had to eat to keep his sanity. Now, let, let, me, let me imperatorically insert this. Some of y'all, what you call demonic attacks is you just need to go have some lunch. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Some of y'all, I just feel like this pressure is coming against me because you're hungry. Go get you a sandwich, and I guarantee you the demon of that pressure is going to leave you. <laughs> Mark chapter 11, verse 12. Now, the next day when they come from Bethany, he was hungry. Verse 13. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And this is interesting because the text says that he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. Because it had leaves. Now, this was an interesting paradox because the leaves would indicate that there was some fruit. But when Jesus got up on it, there were just leaves and there were no fruit. But Jesus knew that it wasn't the season for figs. But he said, since you're presenting yourself as if you have fruit, you ought to have fruit. I don't know about you, but it's nothing like when people try to pontificate to you about the fruit that they bear, but then they really don't actually bear the same fruit themselves. And so Jesus said, it's not the season for the fruit, but my question is, why did you fake me out and play me like you had some fruit? Because you said you had leaves. That's like folk that have come in your life and have told you they're going to be there through thick and thin and they're going to do this and do that. They presented it, but they had some fruit, but the truth was they were just leaves, no fruit. So look. Jesus said, Jesus said, he said, he said, uh, because what you need to know about a fig tree is that the seed and the flower uh, are one. The, the, the fig, uh, the fruit and the, and the leaf, they would appear simultaneously. So when Jesus sees that there's no fruit, Jesus is like, well, what is the problem? Say he has a problem. Now, what did we just read, Harvest, that he was what? Hungry. Legitimate problem. He was hungry. He went to something that should have had fruit, didn't have fruit. So let's see how Jesus responds to his problem. You ready for this? Look at verse 14. In response, uh, matter of fact, I want you to read it so you catch this whole concept. In response, go to the verse in response. Ready? Here we go. One, two, ready, read. In response, Jesus said, Stop. What did he do? Jesus went over and grabbed the tree. It was like, tree, I don't know what the problem, no. In response, Jesus said, I have a problem here. Lead the scripture up. He says, I have a problem here. The problem is, is that you have something that I won't, but you, you were faking me because the truth is, is you really never had it. 
So Jesus says, to it. Okay, come on. All right, come on, come on, come on. All right. In response, Jesus said to it, not to them, he or she, which means every problem going on in your life has ears to hear what you're saying. If God could talk to a tree, you can talk to your circumstance, your situation. In response, Jesus said to it, but that ain't even the best part. In response, okay, I feel it here, which means the tree was really speaking to Jesus when it didn't give him what he asked for. Y'all ain't hearing what I'm saying. There's some stuff in your life that it's time for you to respond to because you've been letting it talk you down and discourage you and depress you, and you need to turn around and respond to it. There's some depression. You need to turn around and respond. Jesus responded to the problem of the tree not giving him what he wanted. See, where the radical people at that would look at a bill or whatever your issue is and say, I got a response for you because what you're doing is talking without using words. You're trying to discourage me. You're trying to depress me, but I got a response. Somebody shout, I got a response. Yes, sir. The best part of the verse is the second word. In response. Which means, I want to make sure we get it. Every problem, let's be honest, that you face is really talking to you. You ain't this. You ain't that. You ain't really as blessed as you say you are. You ain't really as smart as you say you are. You, you ain't really, you ain't really, you ain't this, you ain't this, you ain't that. Let's be honest. When a problem shows up, you begin to have an internal dialogue that only you and the problem know about. Because the problem's talking to you. I wish I had some real people here. The problem is talking to you. And the reality is that sometimes it talks so loud. And when you don't know you're a king, you'll let it talk when you ought to be talking. Where are the kings and the priests at? That you let your problem talk to you like that for the last day. You, the la yeah, yeah, yeah. Wednesday morning was the last time you're going to talk to me like that because I'm a king and I'm. So watch. So watch. The verse. In response, Jesus said to it. He said to his problem, not a person. Can I tell you something? A lot of times you think your issue is with people, and it's really with the it behind people. Yeah. Scripture says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but rulers of darkness, principalities, spiritual weakness, high places. That means mindsets, established mindsets. Now watch this. Your problem's job is to talk you out of homo legato, to talk you out of agreeing with what he said. What God said. Got it? So the verse, in response, Jesus says to it. The verse, in response, Jesus says to it. Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. You, you understand? You understand what happened? And, and his disciples heard it. I, I need you to get this. I need you to get this. Are, are you here? I need you to get this. Jesus looks at a problem, an inanimate object. A tree doesn't have a brain didn't have a soul. I know some people who like to hug them think they do. <laughs> they don't. They, they don't have a soul. They, they don't have a heart. They don't have feelings. If you chop a leaf off, it's not crying. You follow? Jesus tells an inanimate object what to do. Now, I guess you could argue that it's living for the sake that it has cells and water and oxygen running through it. But the reality is, I don't know about you, but a tree's never spoken to me. And if one has, please see one of these gentlemen right here, and they're going to be glad to help you figure that out. So we can help you out. We love people. Amen. Now, here's what I need you to get. Y'all still with me? I just want to walk it out because the second example I'm going to get you, and then I'm just... I, I, I'm gonna, I probably am going to drop the mic. In fact, if, if, if I don't just do it because of my flow, I'm just going to do it on purpose. Like the, in the Baptist church, the preacher, when they done, sometimes they get real good to it. They just 
or they just go to their seat and turn around and all the deacons would come around. Come on, come on, Rev, come on, Rev, preach it, Rev, Rev, preach it. <laughs> Jesus said, watch it, to his credit report. Now you're sitting here shouting over it, an inanimate object. Jesus spoke to his problem. And he told his problem, this is what's getting ready to happen to you. Not let his problem push him around. It's Wednesday night, so I just think, I think there's maybe 20, 30, 40, something like that of y'all that you're tired of getting pushed around by your problems. Okay. It ought to be somebody in here that says, I'm tired of wanting to be happy, but my problem tells me I can't. I'm tired of wanting to have joy, but my problem tells me to be depressed. I'm, I'm sick and tired of my problem telling me what's going on. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. You waking up saying it's going to be a great day, then your problem will be like, no, it ain't. Jesus, Jesus, y'all here? Be seated, be seated, watch this. And Jesus responded to his problem. He responded, watch this, to his low self-esteem. He responded to his feeling of inadequacy. He responded to his thoughts that nothing ever go right for him. He responded to his thoughts that every time he trusts somebody, this and that and that. Y'all ain't going to say nothing to me. He responded to his problem, and he said, let me tell you something, it. Touch neighbor, say, you got an it. Truth be told, you probably got a book full of its. And guess what we all do? But tonight, somebody online is going to get this. But tonight is the last night that your its get to keep pushing you around. Excuse me, I just need to talk street because we're going to take that trick out back. And that's going to be the last they heard of that problem. That's going to be the last they heard of that issue. Now, my sis, verse. In response, Jesus said to it, shout it. Let no one eat fruit from you ever again and everybody around him heard it now let me tell you why it's important that the scripture says everybody around him heard it because Jesus is getting ready to teach us a very powerful lesson are you ready I said he's getting ready to teach us a very powerful lesson are you ready okay go down to verse number I'm gonna I'm I'm skip and get to the get to the quick way uh, go down to verse number 18 verse number 18 so Jesus tells the fruit or the, the fig tree Nobody's ever going to eat fruit from you again. What's implied in that statement? You're going to die. Because a tree would naturally produce fruit. So if nobody's ever going to eat fruit from it again, even the tree would have to be isolated and have some kind of force field around it. Or the tree just has to die. It's about 2,000 years ago. I don't know that force field technology was really that strong in those days. So we're going to go with the latter. All right, so here it is, verse 18. And the scribes and chief priests heard it and saw that they, uh, how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. Now, 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 next verse. When evening had come, he went out to the city. Next verse. Now in the morning. Go, go back to the, verse, to, to the previous verse. I just, I just need to see if y'all were here at New Year's Eve. Go, go, matter of fact, go back to 18. And the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. Can I tell you, the folk that have issues with you, really, their issue ain't with you. Their issue is with what you don't know about you. You sitting up here saying, you talking about me and I ain't even got this and that and this and that. It's because they already know that this and that is getting ready to manifest. And what is it that hell knows about you that you have not yet discovered about yourself? Verse 19. When evening had come, he went out to the city. 
which means when he cursed the tree, it, 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 it was earlier. So when evening comes, he goes out to the city. Verse 20. Now in the morning, as they passed by, I don't think you understand what I'm trying to tell you. What he decreed. All right, I won't even give you the revelation. I'll let it be. Now in the morning. Somebody shout the morning. As they passed by. Now here's the trip about it. Jesus, they could have went anyway. They could have went over here. They could have took 225. They could have took 25. They could have took the damn road over here. They could have they could have took Parker Road. They could have took I they could have took a lot of different ways to get to the same place. You follow? But Jesus said, no, let's walk this way. Why did Jesus want them to walk that way? Because when he spoke it, they heard him. So he wanted to teach them a lesson. Come on, listen, Linda. He wanted to teach them a lesson. So he says, gentlemen, sons, let's walk this way. Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw. Wait a minute. 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 Uh, go, go back up just so we get this. Verse 14. Verse 14. Come on, verse 14. In response, Jesus what? Said. Go to verse 20. Now in the morning, as they passed by, and God said, let there be, and there was, and God saw. So now we see this principle is established throughout the text, that when I want to see something different, I don't confess my problem. I say what I want to see until I see it. Now in the morning, as they, can I preach just a little bit tonight? Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Now Jesus said, ain't nobody going to ever eat from you again. So we already determined that since force field technology wasn't around, it had to die. And Jesus says, come on, sons, let's walk this way. Directly in front of the tree. And they recognized the tree. Now watch it. The scripture says the tree was dried up from the roots. Which meant in that 24-hour period after he decreed it, his words, come here John 6, 63. His words, which are spirit, left his mouth, entered the tree, went to the roots of the tree, and dried up the, you're not hearing what I'm saying. When you speak, what you speak is heard by everything and everybody around you. And that somebody shout, I'm a king. So, so watch. So watch. So watch. Y'all okay? <laughs> so it was dried up. Watch this. From the roots. Now, I don't think you understand the significance of it saying from the roots. If the roots die, the fruit will never live again. There's some problems in your life that all you really did was paint the fruit. You never actually dealt with the root. Y'all not hearing what I'm saying? And that's why it seems like every year around the same time, you're dealing with the same mess. You know why? Because you never dealt with the root of the problem. You just dealt with the fruit of the problem. But tonight, you came to the right place because tonight, we finna get to them roots, baby. And it ain't growing back again. It ain't coming back next year. Tonight, it's last night. I wish I had some people that would shout in this house if you believe it. It's the same old sad song every year. Because all you did was deal with fruit. And you painted it. You said it looks good. But you, you violated spiritual principle. You were supposed to speak before you touched. You were supposed to decree before you dug. Y'all okay? So look, be, be seated, be seated, be seated. I only got one more thing to show you. I got this thing cut me off, right, y'all? <laughs> look, verse 21, and Peter, the rock, <laughs> remembering. Now, it's interesting um, because, I mean, what would be tough about remembering the day before? But now I can sympathize with Peter because sometimes we forget. 
You ever forgot something? You ever left the conversation and forgot everything in the conversation? And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, teacher, look. He was astonished because all Peter's life, all Peter did was struggle. So he's astonished to see a king at work. What God is wanting to do with you in your life is to mesmerize your relatives and your bloodline and the, oh, because all your bloodline has been stress and strain and struggle and mess after mess and issue after issue. And he says, I want you to astonish them because you're going to stop acting like a peasant and start acting like a king. Listen, what do you mean? And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, he's shocked. He's shocked by it. He's like, look. And Jesus is like, duh, man, that's why I brought you over here. I'm omniscient. I'm all knowing. So I knew, I knew what it was going to look like. And he remembered. Touch your neighbor and say, you need to remember. Because truth be told, you'll say, no, Bishop, I've been speaking good. I've been speaking good. You ain't remembering right. Because if you'll really remember right what you're in, you spoke it. Now, let me go ahead and get to people and say, but Bishop, I didn't say it out loud. See, John 6, 63, the words are spirit. Which suggests to us that sometimes it doesn't have to enter the external atmosphere to make you self-sabotage internally. You were talking to yourself, and that's the problem. You're doing stuff ain't nobody asked you to do. So because you sat up and contrived all this in your mind, you're like, well, Lisa, I didn't say it. But what you don't understand is, is your mind said it to you. And since your mind said it to you, you're reaping in you the harvest that you said to you. And so now you've spoken to yourself. And so now you self-sabotage. The circumstance was ready to give you what you asked for. But you self-sabotage because you've been talking to you. All right. All right. Here it is. First. And Peter, remembering, said to him, look, the fig tree which you cursed. Now, Peter, Peter knew that it was a curse because as a Hebrew, he understood that Jesus was speaking death to it because he wasn't speaking life. In the realm of Hebrews, there's the realm of life, the realm of death. Realm, same for Christians. There's Jesus said, or excuse me, the scripture says, I said before you the blessing and the curse, life and death. Therefore, choose life. Got it? So Peter knew that based on what Jesus said, Jesus was taking that fig tree out of the realm of life and placing it in the realm of death. So that's why he says that that tree you said this to, he didn't have to quote him because by virtue of what Jesus said, he knew it put it in the realm of death. It was a curse. But a curse is an empowerment to fail, not to prosper, not to do well, to, to not be whole. That's a curse. You understand this? The blessing is the converse. It is the power to prosper, to do well, to be made whole. Shalom. Nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken, all is well. That is the blessing. Now watch this. Teacher, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered away. He's shocked. He's like, I didn't really think it was going to work this fast. Because Peter had never seen a king at work. Okay, maybe talk to the middle because maybe y'all understand English around y'all. Peter was so used to stressing and struggling and straining that he just knew that after Jesus cursed it, that the disciples was going to get sent back that night to uproot it. Because his whole life was stress, strain, and struggle. But when he met Jesus, Jesus says, I want to introduce you to a whole nother way of doing things. I ain't finna get my nice white robe dirty. Are you crazy? I cursed the tree. I ain't finna get down there and mess with the tree. You not understand what I'm saying, Harvest. You've been dealing with your problems like a human. Not a king and a priest. You've been dealing with them like an average person. And you sit up and say you serve the king of kings. And you sit up and say you serve the Lord of lords. But you're not, adre you're not responding to your problems like you are. You're getting stressed out. You're taking sabbaticals from church. You're sitting at home with the air on. You got a nasty attitude. You're mad at the world. 
you posting all kind of weird computer stuff. You sending all kind of weird emails to people with all kind of mixed messages. Like, I just want to tell you, thank you for being there for me all my this time. What is it? What are you writing? What are you trying to say? I just saw you yesterday. What are you talking about? <laughs> and Jesus is saying, you're not acting like a king. You're not acting like a priest. You're acting like a regular human. So Peter, y'all all right? I'm going to give you one more scripture example, and that one's going to shout me. So that at some point, I'm liable to just have an outburst of exuberance and just, I don't know. Now, look at me. Y'all look at me. What it has been perpetually bothering you, and you let it bother you because you convince yourself it's just got to bother you. Jesus said, I got a solution for you. Don't keep a problem longer than 24 hours. <laughs> Jesus said, you'd have my money on Monday, got to go by Tuesday. You wasn't producing on Monday, got to go by Tuesday. You don't negotiate with your problems. You don't negotiate for their dismissal. You dismiss. Now, uh, y'all sit with me? What it do you need to respond to tonight? What it do you need to respond to tonight? All right? Stuff coming up in your mind? All right, now let me give you one more example of this. This is Jesus. So I know some of y'all think, but that's God. Bishop, that's God. Like he can do anything. But I thought he said he chose to live in us. So if the God that can do anything lives in me, by virtue of his living in me, then I can. It's real simple, right? Okay. If, if, you, go, um, if you go to the airport and you get in the plane, and you're the pilot of the plane, got it? And let's just assume you know how to fly. <laughs> okay. And you're the pilot of the plane, right? So check this out. If you're the pilot of the plane, wherever you desire to go, that plane is going. So then it would also be safe to say wherever the plane is, that's where you are. So then if Jesus is in you, then whatever impossible he wants to do. So then wherever you are, then he is. Let me give you one more example. 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Y'all all right? I'm just teaching tonight. Is that okay? You good? Won't God do it? Ain't he all right? Oh, he make a way. <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> now, we're going to read a few verses here. Uh, I should have had him set us up. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now, let me give you, let me give you we're going to start at verse 28, and uh, then we're going to go through this, and some of this is familiar, and, and then we're going to confess some stuff, and then we're going to set you on this path. And uh, and I want to encourage you, especially those watching online, don't miss the next few Wednesdays because we're going to I'm going to keep adding on to this because the Lord said, son, take them back around that because because they're not we need to go back around that again. So we're going back around that again. So we get it because I, I am determined to pastor a people that are kings and priests. I am determined to pastor people that rule, reign, conquer and subdue. I'm determined to pastor an excellent above average people. I won't have it any other way. You got it? First Samuel chapter 17. Now, let me give you the history of what's going on here. David has uh, uh, been anointed uh, to be king. Now, you know the story. I've told you a bunch of times. Samuel, the man of God, comes to Jesse's house. Jesse is David's father. Comes to Jesse's house, and he's like, listen, God said the king, the next king is in this house. So Jesse presents his, his oldest sons to uh, the man of God. And the man of God's like, no, he's not it. He's not it. He looks like he should be it, but he's not. He looks like he should be it, but he's not. He looks like he should be it, but he's not. So he goes through his sons, and he says, there must be somebody else here because the one God wants isn't here yet. 
And so Jesse says, well, I do have this son, David. He's out there, but he couldn't really possibly be king material. I mean, he deals with the sheep all day. He's stinking out there. Now, he don't look bad, but he's just stinking. He's out there with them sheep all day. He got all this going on. And so he's out there. You still here? You still here? And so David comes in the house. And we know David dealt with some form of rejection because his father did not think enough of him to even bring him in the house when the man of God came to the house. And in those days when the man of God came to the house, it was a big deal that the man of God was coming to the house because he came with his entourage. They laid out a spread. It was a big deal. It's kind of like why in the South, when the preacher goes to somebody's house, it's a big old deal. They cook a big old meal. and the whole, I mean, they do a big old meal. They put the pig on the table, put the apple in the pig, you know. I'm just playing. So, so what happens is, is now David's been anointed. And the Bible says that Samuel stands up and he takes the horn of oil and he anoints David in the midst of all of David's brothers. You got that? He's, he anoints him to be king in the midst of all his brothers. David has now just been given a promise, but now David is in what's called process. Now, the moment of the promise was very nice. It was very good. But what David needed to understand is for the next 14 or so years, he was going to be in a process to the throne. Just because the throne was promised to him didn't mean he'd immediately inhabit it. Can I suggest to you that don't you get discouraged in your process on way to your promise? Y'all not hearing what I'm saying. Had David not been able to survive and endure and thrive in his process, he never would have made it to his promise because it was rough. Tell somebody to say it was rough. Uh, so I'm here to just encourage somebody right through here that whatever is rough right now, baby, don't you stop, don't you quit, don't you stop pushing because you're in route to a throne. And who sits on thrones? Kings sit on thrones. You're on your way. To so watch. So he's been anointed to be king. So since he's been anointed to be king, watch it. Although he's still a shepherd, He's got to fight the battles of what he's been anointed to be. See, some of y'all, the issue you got is you're saying, why am I dealing with all these big issues and these big problems? It's because you don't realize when God chose you and when God picked you up and snatched you out of the world, and they used to say it like this, when he picked you up and when he turned you around and when he placed your feet up, when God did that, he said, now I've chosen you and you might still be a shepherd, but you're going to have to start fighting the battles of what you're going to be. Which means I'm going to tell you the reason your problem seems so big is because the truth is you fighting battles for levels way higher than you're currently at. But that's because you got to qualify for where you're going. So he, y'all here? So he's a shepherd, but he's got to fight the battle of a king. You missed it. He's a, he's a customer service rep, but he's got to fight the battles of the CEO. I'm just trying to make it practical for you. He's a nobody, but he's got to fight the battles of a somebody. See, some of y'all, because you sat up and wondered, why all of this? Because you're like, for where I'm, what I'm currently doing, why I'm do all of this? It's because those problems came from the future. It's like Terminator. Your problems came from the future, not from the present. Your problems took a peek in your future and decided this is the amount of force necessary to stop them from ever getting to their future. So if we can stop John Connor here, he'll never make it there. Y'all ain't hearing what I'm saying? Come on, act like you didn't watch the movie before. So your problems have come from your throne, not from your pit. That's where they're from. So you're like, ooh, this is a lot. God's like, I know. That's a king's battle. That's a king's battle. And he has made us. I'm teaching you how to be a king. I'm teaching you how to decree. I'm teaching you how to answer. I'm teaching you how to be a king. You, you didn't understand that. David, you're a shepherd right now. But I'm teaching you. How to be a king. You broke right now. But I'm teaching you how to be a job creator. You stressed out right now, but I'm teaching you how to help other people. Get up out of their mess. You, your life is a mess right now, but I'm giving you a message. You're in a test right now, but I'm giving you a testimony. You got an issue right now, but I... Somebody shout... So here it is. So here it is. 
Here it is. Y'all okay? Yeah. All right. All right. So, so, so David's getting ready to go in this battle. And this is the last scripture I'm going to give you, and I'm taking my seat. 1 Samuel 17, but I figure you came on Wednesday nights. You must be thirsty. 1 Samuel 17, verse 28. Now, David was anointed in the midst of who? His brethren. Now, look at what happens. So, Goliath comes up to taunt the children of Israel for 40 days and 40 nights. Goliath, he's a giant. It's a Philistine. Philistine means invader. So, the invaders come and they taunt him for 40 days, 40 nights. King Saul, who's the incumbent king, he doesn't want to fight the battle. He, he said, Please understand. It's some stuff that the reason you got to deal with it is because who should have knocked it out? <laughs> left it. And, and you sitting there saying, I got to pick up this and pick up this and deal with this and deal with this and deal with that. It's because your Saul left you giants. It's some stuff your mom and them was supposed to knock out the bloodline. And now you're dealing with what she didn't deal. And, and, okay, all right. 1 Samuel 17, 28. Y'all still here? Now, Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. Basically, David was like, so what's going to happen for the man that kills Goliath? I, I, I want to know. They were like, well, the king's going to give him a daughter. He's going to have a tax free, some tax freedom. He's going to get some, some real good bread. It's going to be good for him. So his brother, watch this, is listening to him ask about what happens to the man that can fight the king's battle. Now Eliab, his older brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I'd spend time there, but that's not the point. And whom have you left these few sheep with in the wilderness? In other words, how dare you try to act like things are getting ready to get good for you? How dare you act like you ain't got to struggle no more? How dare you act like you ain't got to be messed up no more. Look what he says. I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you've come down to see the battle. Verse 29, here it is. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? In other words, he said, what, what's the problem now? What the problem is now? You're always saying something, Eliab. If I don't fight, you call me a punk. If I do fight, you say I need to sit down. If I do this, <laughs> And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. Now, when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul and he sent for him. So when David was talking to the men about what happens to the guy who fights the king's battle and kills Goliath, the men went to Saul. Saul says, well, bring David to me. Then David, verse 32, said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine." So David gets in front of the king, and he says, listen, king, listen, I understand. Some folks stressed out. Some folks worried. He says, but don't let anybody give up. Heart fail, mind fail. Don't let anybody have a mind breakdown. He said, because I'm going to go, and I'm going to fight with this Philistine. And look at what he says. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You are a youth, and he's been a man of war from his youth. Watch this. What Saul perceived as David's weakness was really David's strength. Somebody in here needs to know what you think makes you weak is what really has been making you strong. What you th Verse 34, here it is. But David, now this is where we get ready to shout. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? Verse 34. But that, so Saul's like, you can't do this, David. You can't do this. You have too many disadvantages. You got too many issues you've had too bad of a past you you made too many mistakes you you're not quite the right fit you're not quite this you're not quite this but look at how David responded David evidently uh, since that oil fell on him to become king started talking like one let's look at what he says your servant used to keep his father's sheep now wait a minute who stopped him from being a shepherd y'all ain't gonna say nothing be a good church your servant used to keep his father's sheep. Well, his brother just said, did you lead the sheep? Which means he was still a shepherd, but his confession was, I'm greater. Y'all are way too slow for me. He was still a shepherd, but look at his confession. I used to. Y'all ain't going to say nothing to me. He said, I used to do that, but he's still a shepherd. Somebody going to get it. He said, now, look, look at me. Okay. okay, look at me, look at me, look at me. Everybody look at me. Hello. David said to Saul, your servant used to keep 
his father's sheep. But we just discovered from a couple of verses earlier, he's still a shepherd. But when Samuel put that oil on him and said, you're getting ready to become king. He changed his confession and he stopped declaring the facts and he started declaring the truth. Y'all not homo legeo, his confession. He said, if the man of God said, I'm going to be the king, then I'm going to be the king. If the man of God said, I'm the head and not the tail, then I'm the head and not. But the man of God, that's what it is. That's what they would say. It is what it is. He changed his confession. Y'all ain't getting it. Verse. But David said to Saul, he's still a shepherd. But he says to the king, I used to. When your problem says, come on, let's be depressed. I used to. When you feel like acting crazy, I used to. When you want to cut somebody out, I used to. When you want to act a natural born fool, I used to. When you want to act crazy, I, I used to. When you want to give up and throw in the town, I, I used to. Where the used to people at? Where, where? But David said to Saul, I used to. I used to think nothing ever worked for me. And then I came to harvest and that man told me that all things are working together for the good. Oh. But David said to Saul, I used to. He's, you don't get it, y'all. He was still a shepherd. But he's calling things that are not. So when your paycheck comes and you're like, oh, I don't know, you say, I used to get stressed. But since I'm a giver, I'm going to watch God take this and make it do more than it's ever done before. Why? Because he promised me he'd open up the windows of... I got to finish. Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. You used to be broke. You used to be discouraged. Y'all ought to say something. You got me sweating this little t-shirt out. Y'all ought to say something. You, you used to be. Touch your neighbor and say used to be. You used to be a gossip. You used to be a chronic worrier. You used to be a chronic complainer. Used to, used to, used to. High five, two people say used to, used to, used to. Even if you still are, you say you used to. Don't wait until it is what you say. Say it until it is what you said. You used to turn to the bottle. You used to turn to the pipe. Used to. Even if you got a bottle under your cabinet now, you walk in there. Used to. Y'all ain't going to say nothing. Where the real folk at? Even if you still are, you say, I used to. Because I'm calling things that be not as though they were. I'm agreeing with God. Watch. He says, he says, your servant, y'all okay? I've been up here for a little over an hour, so it's too much teaching for you. He said, your servant used to keep his father's sheep, still a shepherd. But he said, I got this opportunity to stand in front of this king. And that man of God told me two chapters earlier that I'm to be the next king. And so even though I have no clue how this is going to take place, the best thing I can do is use my mouth for my street folks. You got to use what you got. Oh, y'all knew that. Okay, watch this. David said, I can't go forcibly take the throne, but I got a mouth that can confess it. <laughs> he said, watch this. He said, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. <laughs> and when a lion 
or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and I struck it and I killed it. In other words, David said, uh, I'm going to get my confession right. And to help me fuel my confession, because it's going to be difficult to keep fueling confession to say what God said. That's going to get hard sometimes because you're going to want to just report what it is versus calling it what he said. So when that gets tough, watch what David said. I'll remind myself that when a lion came out, I hit it. I, let me get straight because y'all understand that. And I hit it in his mouth. And when I hit it, it was trying to eat the lamb, but I was just like, oh, no, that's my lamb. And that's, I, I, I'm the shepherd, and that's my lamb. And so you ain't going to mess with mine because I've been taking care of that. I've been, do, I've been praying for that. I've been, no, that, no, 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 no. And he said, and when the lion tried to ride, roll up on me, watch this, he said, I grabbed it by its beard. Y'all ain't hearing what I'm saying. This little boy said, I grabbed it by its beard, and I struck it, and I killed it. Touch your neighbor and say, remind yourself. When you don't feel like confessing and saying what God says, remind yourself. You've already been to hell and pack. That's why when people say go to hell, you ought to tell them, I've been there. I've ridden every ride they've got, and I came out licking an ice cream cone. I... Where are the people that can shout about the fire you've been through, that can shout about what he's delivered you from? You, you've already been to hell and back, baby. Who? I'm through. Watch. Here's the next verse. This is the shouter. Your servant... Kill both lion. And then he said, oh, and I got me a bear too. He said, and this uncircumcised, that means he wasn't a Jew. So he says, he don't even have a covenant with you. He's going to be like one of them. Seeing that. He has defied the armies. Who are we talking about? David is one man. But David said, when you mess with me, David said, he didn't just come against you, Saul. He came against all of us. Well, who is all of us? David's one man, and nobody else wants to fight the battle. David says, I got so much confidence that I'm going to talk about a group of people behind me that ain't even there. <laughs> you know your neighbor's problem? They're waiting on a co-signer. And there's some battles you're just going to have to go out there and say, if God be for me, who can be against? Here it is. I'm not doing no second CD, so here it is. Watch this. You hear? He will be like one of them. Like one of what? The lion and the bear. Seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Do y'all understand what David is doing now? David is now speaking. He wasn't praying. He was speaking. Y'all not hearing what I'm saying. David is putting in the atmosphere. What's getting ready to come into him. I'm here to tell you your atmosphere is ready for you to start. Look, he says, verse 37, moreover, David said, the Lord whom delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. Watch this. He will. In the old church, this is where the preacher would close his book and say, he will. Does anybody know that you serve a God that not only is willing, but he's also able. He will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Stop saying, I don't know if it's going to work out. Change your I don't know to, it will. Stop saying, I'm not sure, it will. What are it will, people? At? Stop, stop letting your problem punk you. You better, it will. Somebody says, how are you going to get over that? I will. 
How you gonna make it through that? I will. How you gonna get through this challenge? I will. How you gonna make it through this obstacle? Watch me. I will. Somebody shout, I will. Watch the verse. And Saul said to David, well, go, and the Lord be with you. Y'all want me to give you the revelation? I'm going to skip past a bunch of verses. So basically, they come together. They're ready to fight. And look at verse, four, uh, look at verse 43. And I just need y'all to read it because I need to save my voice for this weekend. Verse 43. Ready, read. Look at me. Where, where did we see this? The fig tree spoke. Jesus responded. David spoke. Or uh, uh, Goliath spoke and David responds. Watch David's response. Put the verse up. 44. Here it is. 44. So the Philistines said, verse 44. 44. Come on, come on. 44. Come on. 44. 44. 44. Here it is. And the Philistines said to David, come to me. And I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts. Of so, so his problem is really talking him dirty. He said, you coming at me like a dog? You got uh, 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 some, some rocks and a slingshot? I'm a general. You don't come at me with some rocks and a slingshot. But what Goliath didn't know is what David had already spoke. Verse. Verse 45. Then David said to the Philistine, say it. In other words, he said, problem, I got to break it to you. You had no business coming up here talking all this. You had no business coming up here thinking you finna do this and finna do that. Somebody shout, problem. problem. You had no right and no business coming at me like that. So look at verse 46. Here it is. 46. This day. The CD's over, so this is the overflow. Here it is. This day. Not sometime soon. Not in a few months. Hopefully things will be. David said, today. The Lord is going to deliver you into my hand. And I'm going to hit you in your face. And then I'm going to take your head from you. And this day, I'm going to give your carcasses to the camps of the Philistines, to the birds of the air, and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God. Y'all missed it, Harvest. Y'all missed where to shout. Y'all missed where to shout. Y'all missed where to shout. I said, y'all missed where to shout. You missed it. You, you, you missed it. Verse 46. This day. Wednesday. August. 13. 2014. This day. You didn't just come to no regular church. You didn't just come to no regular man of God. You didn't just come to no regular service. You came to what's called a this day. And for the next five minutes, we're going to put in work. Y'all ready? Stand on your feet. Now, I want you to get every it, every problem, every circumstance, every situation. I want you to get that on your mind. And I want you to get it on your mind to where it makes you mad. Now, don't hurt your neighbor because your neighbor's going to have to hurt you back. All right? You got it? I'm quick. That's all the it's y'all got? Oh, you still adding your it's up? Oh, you got your it list. Okay. Y'all here? You got it? What is it? What is it that has been slapping you around in your house? And it's been all in your mind. It's been slapping you around all in your mind. What is it? 
What is it? You got it? Okay. So the law of confession says, I say it, then I see it. And David said, I know I'm still a shepherd, but right now I'm going to act like a king. And this day, you will be delivered into my hands. And everything you said you were going to do to me, I'm going to do it to you. Everything your circumstance said it was going to take from you. You've been sitting up here worried, losing hair, got ulcers, got all kind of stress, got all this, got all that, got all that, gaining weight, losing weight, losing all that. You're doing all of that because you're sitting up here letting Goliath talk to you crazy. But this day, you sit, can't even have a full night's of sleep, can't even rest well because you're sitting up here letting problems and Goliath, not, but, but, but this day. You got it? You sure? Now here's what I want you to do. We're going to decrease some things and then we're done. Say, Father, Father, in the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus I've, heard the word. I've heard the word. I'm applying the word. I'm, applying the word. I'm, decreeing, the word. I'm decreeing the word. I'm declaring the word. I'm declaring the word. I, agree I agree with you. With you. Say this day. this day. And don't say that if, if you're just playing with it. But if you real about that, declare it. You, know, you got to own that part because that's the most powerful part. Own it. Say it. September ain't going to work. October ain't going to work. November ain't going to work. December ain't going to work. Shout it. Now say problem. You have tormented me. For the last time. And this day. I declare. That from your roots. You've got to flee. Get out. Go. I am, I am a king. I am a priest. I am a priest. I've spent my last day, my last day living, in living in average. But this day, but this day I, use I use confession to change my life. Change my life. I'm, saying I'm saying it so I can see it. So I see and, it. I decree, and I decree and I declare, and I declare I'm, blessed, I'm blessed, highly favored, highly favored. empowered to prosper. No weapon that is formed against me shall be able to prosper. Every tongue that rises in judgment, I condemn it. I declare I am in breakthrough, favor, supernatural, depression, discouragement. Let me go this day, this day, this day. Now, if you believe it, I need you to give Jesus the biggest. I said, I need you to give him the biggest. That fig tree ain't going to be there tomorrow. And since the sun is down. We decree that the rest of this week shall be great favor abounding towards you. That unexpected blessing and favor and financial increase shall come now your dwelling. We command the day that is to come. <laughs> Just take you 30 seconds and go for what you know. Just take you 30 seconds and go for what you know. Take you 30 seconds and go for what you know. I said take you 30 seconds and go for what you know. This day. This day. This day. This day. This day. This day.
Tonight, tonight, the head's about an eyes closed. While it's a Wednesday night, Wednesday night, I, I don't want to assume that everybody in here has a relationship with Jesus. Tonight, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ tonight, I want to give you that opportunity to do so. 2,000 years ago, Jesus, God stepped in a body. The body was called Jesus, and that body went to a cross to pay the price for your sin. Sin are things that we do that uh, don't please God. They don't please God because they hurt us. And so not only did he die for your sin, he died so that you could have life and have life more abundantly. It's time for you to live. You've just been breathing long enough. It's time for you to live. I said, it's time for you to live. I said, this day, it's time for you to live. I, I said, this day is. And so if you're in here tonight, you need to become a Christian for the first time, or you need to rededicate yourself to Jesus. If you're here watching online or the Roku, wherever you're at, on the count of three, I want you to throw your hands up. If you need to become a Christian for the first time, or if you've been far from God and you need to return to him tonight, he loves you. He's not mad at you, and he's still got a plan for you. Even if you made a ton of mistakes, I'm here to tell you that Jesus' plan can still prevail. Even if you've made a mess out of things, watch him step in and turn it around for your good. And so tonight, if either one of those is you, on the count of three, wherever you're at, here online, Roku, wherever you're at, on the count of three, Three, I want you to throw that hand up. One, two, three. If that's you, throw that hand up. I see you. 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 Oh, come on, Harvest. You ought to give God praise. On a Wednesday night, people are coming to Jesus. On a Wednesday night, people are coming to Jesus. He saves to the uttermost. Now, I want every hand to be lifted in here because, listen, if you just lifted your hand, we're so proud of you. God's so proud of you right now. And at Harvest, you, I'm telling you what, you found a church that's not going to judge you, that's not going to beat you up, that's not going to throw you down, not even going to love you to death, we're going to love you to life. Now, I want everybody to say this to me. Every hand lifted, everybody say this to me. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I confess my sin before you. Thank you for dying in my place. Because of that belief and because of that confession. If this is my first time praying this, I am born again. I'm a Christian. If I was far from you, I'm reconnected to you. Today is the beginning of great days in my life. This day, I will not keep a problem longer than 24 hours. Another day of my life. Today is the beginning of the rest of my life. This day, this day. This day, in Jesus' name. Harvest, would you just give God praise one more time tonight? Hallelujah. Listen, if you just lifted your hand to become a Christian for the first time or recommit yourself to Jesus on the count of, or on the count of three, you can take out your mobile phone and uh, text the word decision to the phone number 59769. And when you do that, we're going to send you a text message right away that's going to give you some tools to help you serve Jesus faithfully. And I want to encourage you to be faithful to church for 12 months. No man goes to the gym one time and expect to look like some man in a magazine. No woman goes to the gym one time and expect to look like Holly Berry. Or maybe y'all do it. And that's why I know me working. Got it. So here's the deal. Here's the deal. So, so you can't come to church once and expect everything to get, get, get in order. So I want to encourage you to be faithful. Amen. Hug two or three people as you take your seats and just tell them this day, this day, this day, this day. And you can be seated. We're going to see what's happening at your campus.